We've been in uh, the book of 1 Peter, and we're looking at Jesus is our living hope. The first thing we saw is Jesus is our living hope when we just don't fit in. The world's got this round hole, and we're a square peg. And uh, Peter says, well, we don't fit in. We are aliens and strangers in this world. We have been called by God. He actually says, you have been elected by God. You've been chosen by God. You're foreknown by God to be an alien and a stranger. No wonder we don't fit in. He's planned it that way that we don't fit in. The next thing we saw is that we don't fit in. Not only do we not fit in, but he is our living hope when we are tested by fire. So we don't fit in and the world's testing us, but he's our hope that we can get through whatever this world throws at us. And we looked at how the world tries to pressure us into its mold. And I had up on the screen a big jello mold. And the world tries to force us into its mold and we are nonconformist to the world because we are to conform to the very will of God. Last time we looked at, hey, you know, when you need to know who you really are, Jesus is our living hope. He brings clarity to who we are. And when I get into the Word and I look into that mirror, the perfect law of liberty, and I see myself, I see who I am for who God says that I am, and, and Jesus is my only hope of having true clarity of who I am in Christ. Well, today I want to talk about Jesus is our living hope when you have conflicts. Now, everybody has conflicts. I know that because of what this passage says. In fact, there are four kinds of conflicts. Conflicts attack you on four different fronts. And the very first front that is going to contact you, I call an internal conflict, and it's on the spiritual front. You have a conflict inside. We all do. I know that we do. There is a war going on in the inside of every single person. Every believer has it too. You see, it says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, it says, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens. Oh yeah, God chose us. He elected us. He fore, foreknown us to be aliens in the world. And he says, strangers. And sometimes some people say, well, that fits you really well. You are a little bit strange. <laughs> strangers in the world, he says, to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Your soul. That's your immaterial part. Now, I'm a dichotomist, so I believe that the immaterial part has two aspects. And in that two aspects, when my immaterial part, which is my, it's like my body is my physical substance, my immaterial part is an essence, and when it relates upward to God, it's spiritual. It's called spirit. But when it relates horizontally to everything else in life, it's soul. It's soul. And so I have this material part, an immaterial part, and he says, there is a conflict that goes on within my essence of who I am on a horizontal plane, and I have this my whole life here on earth because I'm not glorified, I'm not in my new body. The day when I'm glorified, I won't have this struggle anymore. But you and I both have this struggle. In fact, there are such things as this. Sixty different vices are mentioned in the New Testament. Sixty different things that pull at you and, and, and try to get you to stumble and fall. Now, if I were to spend just one minute on each one of those, we'd be here for 60 minutes or more. <laughs> and you can just see the list going by. It's just going by. And then when he gets all done, in Galatians it goes and it says, and the like. It's like, I didn't cover them all. You, there's stuff that you know. You know I'm not going to enumerate all these things because I really believe. Come on, I know. You know deep down inside the one that is your battle. So I could go down all 60 of them and not even hit yours because yours could be, because there's over 60. Yours could be the one and the like. You know what it is. It's that dark side. It's that, that, that thing. This is how it goes. If I could just conquer this in my life, I could be the perfect Christian. And I don't know what it is. Maybe it's envy. Maybe it's pride. 
Maybe it's self-centeredness, lack of self-control. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's bitterness. I don't know what it is. It, maybe it's my road rage. <clears throat> See what I'm saying? Everyone has that thing, and some is even bigger. It's my addiction. I don't know what it is. But everybody has one. You know how I know? In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, Therefore, let us believers throw off everything that hinders, and it says, and the sin that so easily entangles us. You know what that entangling is? You're running a race. You're running, and you step on your own shoelace. Boom, down you go. You've been entangled by your own shoelace. And he's saying everybody has that, and, and it's, it's there in your life, and you battle it, and it's an internal conflict between my old nature and my new nature, the old me and the new me in Jesus. And I got this conflict, and it goes on and on and on. Listen to what he says in Ephesians. You used to live in that conflict all the time, all the time. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the craving of our sinful nature. We just caved into it. I just caved into it. I was like Pavlov's dog. Man, you ring the bell and I blew my diet. I ate everything in front of me. All right? That's the way I lived. I want it. I want it. And there was nothing because I was living for myself and not for the Lord. And I caved into that thing. I was following the desires and thoughts like the rest of the world. We, before we became Christians, were by nature objects of wrath. I lived just like everybody else in this world, selfishly and for myself, according to my old sinful nature. I love verse 4 because there's that little word, but. And you know when the but comes in, it negates everything that went before it. So when that person is praising you, telling you've done a great job at work and everything, and then they say, but, you know what's coming next. Boom, now they're going to nail me for what I didn't do right. Go, this is just the opposite. You've done everything wrong. You've lived for the world. You lived for your lust. You lived for just everything that popped into your mind. And you had no self-control. And he says, but, hold the story there. Because of his great love for us. Oh. Are you getting a picture? God loved us when we were terrible sinners. The whole idea that I'm going to make myself good enough for God, he's saying, don't, don't think that for a moment. You lived in the worst conditions you could possibly live in, he says, you live for yourself. But God loved us anyway. God, who is rich in mercy, the word mercy means I don't give you what you deserve. I don't give you what you deserve. But he made us alive with Christ. Oh, there we go. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, even when we were dead in our sins, something happened. God gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit who regenerated us, infused life in us. He gave me life. He says it's by grace. Ah, the word grace means a gift. An undeserved gift. He gave you that. So, I used to live a sinful lifestyle. It dominated me. It controlled me. It was my nature. And then God did something. He made me alive and gave me a new nature. A new nature. And so now in this life, I got two natures. A new nature and that old one I used to live in. And there is a conflict inside of me. There is the new nature that wants to pursue God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind. And then there's my old nature said, you really liked that old sin, didn't you? That really made you feel good, didn't it? Well, yeah, for a little while, and then I felt so guilty, I re regretted I ever did it. And I got this conflict, this struggle going on inside. He said, you lived in it until, like Lazarus, remember that? Jesus went and said, Lazarus, come forth. It was that day when you accepted Jesus Christ, you came and you left the death behind and you've got a whole new life, a new nature in Jesus Christ. What he's saying in, in, in Galatians, he says, Galatians 5.24, you have crucified the old self. Wow. Therefore, those who belong to Jesus, you accept Jesus as your Savior, you now belong to him, 
You have crucified the sinful nature with his passions and its desires. You see, he died for my sins, but now I'm dead to them. I don't have to live in them. But I've had years of practice at them. Years of practice at them. So I've gotten really good at it. Really good at it. There's a rut in my life, and I'm stuck in that rut. I think I told you the story about when we were kids, we had the pool table. And my brother and I, we would play pool, and when we knew that I had to make this, we'd take the end of our cue stick and drag it across the felt top on that, right to the, pet, right to the hole, and you kind of hit it, it hit that groove and just roll right into the pocket. Most of us have a groove in our own sinful lifestyle, and what happens? A little temptation comes along, and boom, we hit that groove, and we go right down that path, right into the hole, and we're there, and we say, oh, why did I do that? Here I am again, I'm doing it all over again. I have to tell myself, I don't need the rut. I've been crucified. I don't have to use the rut. I've been crucified with Christ. Listen, I, I quoted this from the baptistry. You see, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. You see, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. So I got this new nature inside, and I got this old nature, and the two are in conflict. And he said, but you crucified that other one. It just keeps raising its ugly head. You got to keep putting it down. That's why he says, take up your cross daily and follow me. Every day I take up my cross. <clears throat> In Romans 14, it says, 13, it says this. Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what he says? Put on Jesus. Oh, there I am. I don't know how you do that. You, 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 you put on Jesus. You know, when sin comes knocking at your door, you say, whoa, I need Jesus. Come on, Jesus, answer the door for me. Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus. And watch what it says. Do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. You know, the person that's an alcoholic thinks about how they're going to gratify their thirst later. And so they stop and buy the bottle and put it in a wrapper and they hide it and they put it in a closet. They're not going to drink it immediately. They're going to go after it later. You see what they're doing? They're thinking about how to gratify. He says, stop doing that. All of us do that in some respect. I'm on a diet. It could be simply a diet. But I justify. I'm buying this cake for the family, but I know well, it's my favorite kind of cake too. <laughs> and we, we rationalize and justify. Why? He said, no, no, you're not supposed to even think about how to feed that lack of self-control. Don't think about it. Don't think about it. So I say, live by the Spirit instead. Think about how to live by the Spirit. Now, he says uh, the, the fruit of the Spirit is how you live by the Spirit. With joy, love, peace, all those things listed. There's nine of them. He says, follow the Spirit's leading. The word live is actually walk. Take a step at a time on the Holy Spirit's prompting. And you have that prompting as a believer in Jesus. You know Jesus that he prompts. He prompts you in your heart to do what is right. He says, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sensual, sinful nature, he says, desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature they are in conflict with each other. You've got that conflict in your heart, and I got it in my heart. There is a war internally going on, whether I'm going to do what God wants or I want, what I want, what the world wants, what I want or the devil wants. Uh, what am I going to do? Am I going to do what God wants? What does God want? They're in conflict with each other. And watch what it says. So that you do not do what you want. You see, it's deep down, fundamentally, when you accept Jesus as your Savior, you want to do what is right. You want to. But you have that rut in your life. Temptation comes. You're that cue ball. You've just been hit into the rut, and you're going down that path. And he says, whoa, 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 you avoid that rut with all you've got. Listen, this is how he says you avoid it. You have to change the way you think. 
You've got to change the way you think. It's all in your mind. Those who live according to the sinful nature, they're giving in to the dark side, they have their mind set on what that nature desires. I, I'm making a provision for myself to fall later by doing something to provide for it. He says, I have my mind set on it. He says, but those who live according, in accordance with the Spirit, I'm walking in the Spirit, they have their mind set on the Spirit, what the Spirit desires. You can't have them both going on at the same time. That's just pretty impossible. Like, I find it's very, very hard to cave into temptation when you're on your knees praying. Because when you're praying, you're pouring your heart out to God, you're not thinking how to fulfill those desires. You're praying. You say, well, yeah, but as soon as I get up, I, I, it's back. Well, then what you got to do is start praying all over again. Listen, he said, get your mind fixed on the right stuff. He says in the next part, the mind of the sinful man is death. That path always leads to death. That's why afterward you're saying to yourself when you're praying, you say, God, here I am again. Here I am again. I caved in again, Lord. The mind of the sinful man is death. It's leading you down that path. The mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. When you say no to that sin that so easily entangles and trips you up, and you get past it, you say, oh my goodness, I feel so great. God is so good. There's no conviction in your heart. There's no guilt. There is nothing more freeing and more joyous than to know that you are guiltless and you are free and you are free. The sinful mind, though, is hostile to God and you feel like, oh, you know, when you cave in, you feel, oh, I'm just a miserable, terrible wreck. I can't do anything right. And, and none of that is true. He's given you the Spirit. You confess your sin. He's faithful and just. Forgive your sin. And you get back on track to resist that one that so easily entangles you when you're trying to run the race of faith. You just get right back up and you go again. So there you are. You're praying for the umpteenth time. Lord, here I am again. And the Lord says, what do you mean again? You see, the last time he forgave you, he wiped it clean. He keeps no records of wrong. The only record of wrong he keeps is he took your sin and put it to Jesus on the cross. He took your sin, put it to Jesus on the cross. It says, <clears throat> the sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law nor can it do so. That dark side will never take you into obeying God. The new nature will push you to obey God every single time. We have a struggle inside. <clears throat> Don't be one of those who are given over to that sinful nature. Romans chapter 1 talks about people that they would not retain God in their minds. And it says, finally it says, Therefore God gave them over to their sinful desires. That's why some people, they live so wickedly. They've been just given over. Said, that, that's what you want? You want all that impurity? Here, I'm going to give you a little taste of it. You just go your way and see what, what happens. And their lives are a train wreck. God gave them over to their sinful desires. He just let go and said, go on. Have it all. Be depraved. It brings me back to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. I haven't gotten out of the first verse yet. Oh my goodness. This could be a long sermon, folks. <laughs> dear friends, dear friends. He's not walking, I mean, he's not talking about a host, hostile people out there. He's talking to us believers. Hey, friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers, chosen by God to be so, to, here it is, abstain. Paul put it this way, the grace of God teaches us to deny worldly lusts and to live righteously, soberly, and godly lives. What? He says, just say no. It teaches us to say no to sin. Abstain from those sinful desires which war with your soul. That's the conflict inside. Wow. Wow. Before I move on, uh, I, uh, there was a great famous preacher in Philadelphia who used to use an illustration about the two natures inside. You've got a good nature, he called that the white nature. 
He's got the bad nature, the old sinful nature. That's the black nature. And he, he paralleled them to two dogs in a fight. You got a white dog and a black dog. And they're fighting each other. And he said, which one's going to win? And the answer to the question was, whichever one you feed will win. And whichever one you starve will lose. That's the way it is with our conflict inside. Whichever one we feed, it will win. And whichever one we starve, it will lose. If you're not having a daily time with God in the Word of God in prayer, you're not trying to share your faith, you're not trying to be open, transparent about Jesus Christ, who you confess as your Savior and Lord, if you're not, but you, you're, you're shrinking there, and the other side, you're living more and more and more like the world, listen, you know who wins those fights? The dark side. But when you're in the Word, you're praying, you're reaching out to people, you're serving Jesus, that side grows and this side diminishes, guess, wh guess who wins? The new nature wins. Not only do we have the internal conflicts, but we also have external conflicts. They are cultural in nature. Cultural in nature. <clears throat> in the 12th verse it says, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they ex accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. They accuse you of doing wrong. I've noticed this. I have certain Christian beliefs. They're grounded in the fact that I'm a theist. I'm a biblicist. I believe in the Bible. I'm a Christocentric worldview. I believe Christ is a, the whole thing. Everything resolves around Christ. And so I have certain things I believe from the Bible. And one of them is so simple that all lives matter. All lives matter. In Sunday school, they taught me that with a song. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Listen, <clears throat> so, but if I say all lives matter, I'm accused of being a white supremacist. See, I'm falsely accused, falsely accused. I believe life begins at conception, and so I'm accused of being anti-women. No, I'm not. I'm pro-women. I'm pro-life. I, I believe that God assigns your gender at conception. You just extract the DNA from that, that little tiny nucleus inside a woman and you can find out whether it's a male or a female. And if it's a male, it's certainly not her body because she's a female. <laughs> but when I say God assigns that, I'm a judgmental bigot. I believe marriage is between a man and a woman. Why? Because that's what the Bible teaches. And I'm, I'm accused of being homophobic. I believe that there are roles in marriage. The husband has a role, he's to be like Christ, and the woman has a role to be like the church, and the marriage is supposed to be a beautiful thing, and I'm accused of misogyny. I believe in a biblical worldview, and then there I'm accused of being anti-scientific. <laughs> hey, listen, the whole thing, I could go on. I mean, we could just do pages and pages of this. Here's the whole point. Live such good lives among the pagan. That's what I live. I live in pagan America. The new religion in America, the national religion, is secularism. It's paganism. Live such good lives among pagan America that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds. You do what is right. You do what is right. And glorify God he says, on the day he visits us. Now, the visits us can be taken two ways. Theologians take this two ways. Visits us in his wrath and judgment or visits us with salvation. Most commentators fall on the side, visits with salvation, because the day will come when that person accepts Christ and then they'll say, wow, you were right all along. <laughs> you were right all along. Third one is governmental conflict. It's political. I know, I talk a lot about politics. You know why? It's in the Bible. <laughs> you can't read any book of the Bible and not find politics in it. You can't. But he gets political here. He says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to the governors. Here, governors use kind of like the cops who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to con uh, commend those who do right. You know, I find a lot of police officers, if you're just polite, 
they give you the benefit of the doubt every time. Because they're really good citizens. Well, I know there are bad cops, but very, very few. Why would you choose that line of work if you didn't want to have a positive influence? So listen, civil obedience. Civil obedience, though, Jesus, you know, was asked, hey, should you pay taxes to Rome? Rome is a godless state. The emperor claims to be God himself. Should you pay taxes to something that's so contrary to God? <laughs> Jesus said, he knew they were just testing. He said, go get me a coin. They brought a coin. He said, whose image is on there? And they said, well, it's Caesar. And then Jesus said, okay, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. Folks, that's how it falls down. I give to Caesar, I give to my government what is the government's. But what is God's, I never give to my government. And if my government, as we'll see in a moment, tells me not to preach, I got to preach anyway. I got to preach. Got to preach. It's a burning in my bones, just like Jeremiah said. You got to preach. Got to preach. Hey, listen. That's the case with Peter. Peter had healed a man, and uh, they couldn't contest that. And then he started preaching because he healed a man. In Acts chapter 3, the guy was leaping for joy because he had been healed. And then Peter's preaching. The, the priests and the leaders pull him aside, and they basically tell him, you can't preach in the name of Jesus. And Peter said, and I got here in chapter 4, verse 19 of Acts, he replied, judge for yourself whether it is right in God's sight to obey you or, or rather than God. Anytime there's a conflict between what our government is telling us to do and what the Word of God says to do, I always obey the Word of God. I submit to God first, government second. There's a lot of laws that the government has passed that I have to abide by. And I'm a lawbreaker if I don't. I would venture to say almost all of us here are government lawbreakers when it comes to driving on the road. We think the government is based on grace, that I can go 10 miles an hour over the speed limit and that's still cool. We're lawbreakers. We are supposed to abide by those. There's building codes, there's all kinds of laws that they do not violate the Bible and I am supposed to submit to those. But any law that violates what God says, I have got to obey God rather than man and submit to the consequences. Peter had to submit to the consequences. It happened again in chapter 5. A chapter later, here he is preaching again, and they haul him back in before them, and they told him, you got to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. And he says, we must obey God rather than man. This whole concept goes back to the Old Testament. Remember the midwives when Moses was born, all the males were supposed to be drowned in the Nile River, and the, the two... Uh, uh, midwives refused to do it. They did not do what the king had told them to do. And God blessed them and gave them children because they had been barren. Wow. It goes into the book of uh, Daniel. Remember the three Hebrew guys? Uh, Nebuchadnezzar built a big image in the desert and said, go out and worship it. And they wouldn't bow down. Everybody's bowing down. And here's these three guys. I don't have three thumbs, but they're sticking up like thumbs, okay? They're standing there, and then he says, okay, I'm going to heat up the fiery furnace seven times harder than it's ever been heated, so hot that the guys who threw him in outside fall dead because it's so intense heat. And he looks up, and he says, whoa, I thought we threw three men in there, and there's a fourth man in there walking about. Who is that? He looks like the Son of God. But before that, he'd ask them to change their minds. That's what I have up here. And the, and the three guys said, if we are thrown in the blazing furnace of the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your God or worship the image of gold that you have set up. He said, either way, we're not caving. You know what? They, they're not fighting. They're not resisting. They're not protesting. They are submitting to the consequence of their actions. And that's what the passage said. Submit yourself to the authority. Listen, being a Christian is not easy. It may cost you your life for an unjust cause. They risk that. Daniel, same thing. He was not supposed to pray, but he prayed three times anyway, got thrown in the, the lion's den, and God sent his angel and protected him. It's not always the case. Sometimes you do what is right 
you submit to the consequences, and you pay the price. Fourth thing, it's an ethical conflict that we have. Ethical. I have an ethical, moral obligation according to this passage. First thing is to do good. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. You show up, you just don't talk up. Do it. Just do it. Do what is right. When you just do what is right, even if you're martyred, they take note. They take note of what you've done. Do good. Thy will be done. Live as free. I love this. Live as free. But do not use your freedom as cover-up for evil. Don't do something good <clears throat> to cover up evil. <laughs> In the early church, Christians were being saved out of paganism. They had meat that had been offered to the idol. And the meat offered to the idol, not, that idol didn't do anything to it. Well, after they offered it to the idol, then they took it and they sold it on the market, and the money then went to the, that pagan temple. Well, Christians come along and say, this is cheap meat. <laughs> and so they'd buy the cheap meat. And then, no. But the people who had come out of that and they had every right to do that. It's meat. That, that, that idol didn't do anything to the meat. It was good meat. But, but, but the people who had come out of that lifestyle of worshiping said, how could you eat that which was given to a false idol? And so Paul says, don't do what you have the right to do if it causes this other brother to stumble. But if it doesn't cause him to stumble, you have every right to do it. He says, so don't use your freedom to hinder another believer. Maybe you're not addicted to alcohol and you can drink and you can stop to the point before you get drunk and that's fine. But you got a brother who's an alcoholic. Do you drink in front of them? Are you kidding me? Don't use my freedom for evil. Don't use that as a cover-up. Listen, he says, live as free as you can. And then he turns right around and says, live as slaves. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? You're free in Christ to live as a servant of God. So I free myself of the ball and chain from the world, my old flesh and the devil, and I put on the ball and chain to serve God, and I do only what God wants me to do. That's the moral thing to do. He says, be respectful. Be respectful. Show proper respect to everyone. When I was a kid, we always called the neighbors, parents, Mr. and Mrs. It's just what you did. You never called them by their first name. It was always the last name. Only adults called each other by their first name, and kids called each other by their first names. It, why? It was all respect. It was respect. Respect. He says, show proper respect to everyone. And then he says, love the brotherhood. You should have a love for Christians. A love for Christians. They're people for whom Christ died. They're your brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, they go by the same sign, and the sign up there is the ichthus sign. The early Christians used this, Jesus Christ, Theo, Weo, Soter. Jesus Christ, uh, God's Son, the Savior. And they draw that sign on, on, in the sand, they do immediately. This is somebody that knows Jesus like I know Jesus. They love that person, immediately took them in. They were hospitable to that person. Fear God. I think there's a lack of fear of God in our culture today. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, like your government, but cannot kill your soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both your soul and the body in hell. Ooh, you'd be afraid of God, God Almighty. Finally, it says, honor the president. Well, I know it says, honor the king. But the term king there, the king, is also used for the emperor of Rome. So what the, the idea of king is the supreme ruler of the territory. You honor the king. We are living in an age where no one honors our president. Listen, a president's polling is the worst I've ever seen. Even his own party is turning on him. It's just a fact. But we are, have never have the right to denigrate, to call names, to despise who he is because of the office he holds and that is what God is saying here. I may disagree with his politics. Truth is, I disagree with a lot of his politics because I follow biblical principles and he doesn't. 
from the simplest things as transgender, I'm on the opposite side that he is on. I, I mean, nevertheless, he is to be given honor. He is to be given honor. I could never wear a Let's Go Brandon shirt because I know it is a euphemism for a cursing out of the president. I could never do that. As a Christian, I should not do that. I should not do that. It's not just true of him. It was a president before him. I would go on Facebook and I just could not be, I don't go on Facebook often. I'm one of those who is a stalker. I just go to see what, what, what people are writing. And I quit. I couldn't believe what some Christians were saying about President Trump. Listen, you could disagree with all of his policies. Uh, all of them. Same with Biden. You could disagree with all of his policies. But you cannot, you cannot as a Christian, tear down the office and the person. I don't even have to obey him. That's what the text before this said. I can be civilly disobedient, but then i got to submit to the consequences of that. All right? But God is telling me, honor the king. Listen. Some of you are reading through the Old Testament, okay? You're reading through the Bible and you're using the Bible reading schedule. And we've been through 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 24, 25, and 26. David is running from King Saul. King Saul is an evil man at this point. An evil spirit from the Lord has filled him. He's out throwing javelins at David to kill him. David is found in 1 Samuel chapter 24. He's in a cave and his men are in a cave. They've gone deeper in it and Saul comes into the cave and he's using it as the restroom. David sneaks up behind and cuts off a piece of his robe. He cuts off that piece of the robe, and then after he's left, it's really cool. The Bible says his conscience was stricken. New International Version. His conscience was stricken. And he says we can't do him any harm. He is the Lord's anointed. He's the Lord's anointed. His conscience was stricken because he cut off a part of his garment that later he was going to say, look it, I could have killed you, but I didn't. But he said, I cut off a piece of the garment of the Lord's anointed. I know what you're thinking, but Biden's not anointed. <laughs> Trump wasn't anointed. Oh yeah, in a way they were. God is in sovereign, absolute control of everything. Everything. He assigns the kings and he... Raises them up and he brings them down. You're saying, well, but wait a minute. I'm a Trump guy and I think they cheated. They stole the election. <sighs> okay. God was still in control of all that. God was still in control. He's the one who's been sworn in under oath. And Well, why would God let that happen? Are you kidding me? Why did God raise up the Babylons to deal with the Israelites? The Babylons were worse than the Israelites. It's because God was disciplining his people. Listen, if you believe God is in control of all things, it could be God is disciplining our nation. Or maybe God is correcting it if you're on the other side of the argument. But God is in control. No matter what you do, what you believe, you have to always honor the king. Listen, I can talk about his policies and say I don't agree with them. I can say they're absolutely wrong. I hate that I have to obey them but it doesn't conflict with the Bible and i got to do that. I can talk about all the inflation, stagflation, the shrinkflation. That's the new one I heard. All the manufacturers are now reducing the size of their products so they can keep the costs down. They call that shrinkflation. Does not matter. When we talk about the president, we talk about him with honor. If you can't find something honorable to say, don't say anything at all. Don't say anything at all. Listen. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that God which uh, except that which God has established. President Biden is there by divine appointment. God is working everything in history to its intended goal, and I've read the end in Revelation. Jesus wins. The authorities that exist have been established by God, even if you don't agree with them. Even if they're doing what we know is not biblical, God is taking it all to his intended goal. 
Let me sum this all up. If you are a Christian, you have four conflicts going on. The first one is internally, it's within you. The second one is external, it's our culture. The third one is governmentally, politically. The fourth one is morally. You've got conflicts, the Bible tells us. You've got them. I'm going to suggest that only with Jesus will you actually come out on the winning side. Only with Jesus will you come out on the winning side. You see, Jesus is our living hope to win our conflicts. Let's pray. Father in heaven, help us, Lord, uh, win those battles on the inside by walking in the Spirit. Lord, win the battles in our culture by doing the will of God, no matter what, so that the world can see our good deeds and say, you know what? I don't agree with them, but they're doing good. Lord, have a victory in our political battles. Stand up for biblical principles, even if it costs us something. And then, Lord, have moral, moral victory. Win those moral conflicts by just doing good. Help us, enable us, Lord. Do it all for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.